All right. Go ahead and turn your Bibles this morning to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. I did a little studying on a subject and decided that y'all get to join me on that study uh, this morning. And hopefully we'll all learn something. I learned things from talking about it. I learned things from you guys. I learned things from looking at it again. Um, so let's, let's look at this and I want to see what we come up with. I have an opinion, but I'm not always right. Y'all can figure that one out by now, hopefully. Uh, but let's turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 14. Before we get too far into this morning, let's pray once more. Dear Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you especially for all the people yeah. here that have come together to learn more about your word. Lord, we, we pray that you'll open our hearts and minds to your word. Help us to see what is written there for us. Lord, as the speaker today, help me to stay out of your way. Help me to say only what I need to say, Lord, and help people to see Jesus and not me. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, in verse 14, um, if you happen to need a spare Bible, there are some on the table over there uh, for anybody to use. But in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14, it says, Of these things put mm. them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So this morning, my question to the church, so everybody's think about it, you can think about your answer for a second. What does it mean to rightly divide the word of truth? Keeping it in context. That's a good point. Keeping it in context. Yes, Brother Mike? Well, the, I guess the main focus of it is to get the message from God, the divine message, not just uh, something else. You want to get what God is trying to tell you. So to understand the, the true message of what is being said. Exactly. Understanding. Okay. Anybody else want to want to kick something out before I offer my two cents? Okay. So I did a little. I did a little studying. I went and look for that rightly dividing that term. It was translated from Greek, so I went a little deeper, and they used the same. The people that translated the King James Bible use the same word that they would use to cut straight. Due to the line. To cut it straightly or correctly. That was interesting. There are no other, as far as I can tell, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not an expert at Greek. As far as I could tell, and the, and the research tools that I was using, there are no other places in the Bible they use that word for dividing. There's lots of other dividing in the Bible. There's dividing for, you know, they divided these things, they cut this apart. There. But it says to cut it straight. And the word pertains to, like, if you were to be a farmer, Miss Pam, and you were to plow a straight line. That's the, that's the word usage here, is to cut straight line. Like with the plow. So... It is to cut it straight. Now, that thought brought me to the parable of the sower, which you'll find in the Gospels, mainly Matthew 13, if you want to find one. And we find different types of ground, okay? So, what is what does the ground represent in the parable of the sower? You can turn there, or if you know the answer, you can toss one off to me. What does the ground represent in the parable of the sower, Brother Glenn? I heard you. different types of minds that hear the gospel. Okay, let's turn to, let's turn to Matthew 13. Let's dig a little deeper. Let's, let's turn to Matthew chapter 13. We'll look at it. And see if you get what I get out of it. And if you don't, that's okay. But let's see if we don't come up with some similar conclusions. So Matthew chapter 13 and verse 3 says, and he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, the sower went forth to sow. 
And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came up and devoured them. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and thorns sprung up and choked them. But other fell into good ground, and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who had ears to hear, let him hear. And it explains through here that the different types of ground are different hearers. The hearts of different hearers were prepared in different ways. Okay? Now you say, Brother Josh, that doesn't, that doesn't explain 2 Timothy chapter 2 completely. I agree. Let's keep looking. But if we think about Paul told Timothy to rightly divide the word of truth. Why do you divide the word of truth at all, Brother Josh? Hey, Nick, I need to read this in the next 30 seconds. <laughs> The, the, the little bit more than you can chew? Oh, okay, so we've got to break it up a little bit. Okay? The gospel is not a 30-second <coughs> understanding. Okay? The word of God. If it was, why is this 66 books? Okay? So it requires some dividing up in our time, in our effort, in our understanding. How do you rightly divide the word of truth? I want you to I want you to think about this question this morning. Okay? Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 28. Isaiah chapter 28. Look for verse 9. So if you've ever planted a garden, raise your hand. Okay. When you prepare the when you plant your garden, Olivia, do you you plant all of your plants all just Throw them all there? Or do you maybe you split them up a little bit? You want the corn over here, the beans over here? Okay. Why do you do that? Why don't you just throw them all in, in the same hole? Because they won't grow right or true or provide what they need to. No. Okay. But they won't grow right. What if you do a bunch of straight rows, but you just you don't, you don't take heed to what you're throwing in? Okay, that was the corn. That was the bean. They're spaced correctly. Uh, that was the tomato. Why do you not do that? Um, the yield won't be the same. Yield won't be the same. Some aren't compatible. Some, some, some will get in each other's way. You certainly, when you go to, to reap the harvest, you'd like to reap all the things in the same rows. You don't want to be, well, I got corn. I got two stalks of corn in that row and three in that row, and I got none in that row. You, you, it doesn't make sense. It's not logical. They don't grow well without each other. And then when you go to reap what you sow, they're not like with other things. Okay? So it's... It's logical and profitable to sow in an orderly manner, right? So in Isaiah chapter 28, verse 9, it says, Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people, to whom he said, This is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. But the word of the Lord was unto them, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, that they may go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. Okay. So, the word of the Lord was under the precept upon precept. What does that mean? Must be in order. All right. Nick, take math in school? Okay. Do they teach arithmetic, which is 1 plus 1, 2 plus 2, 3 plus 3? Or do they teach differential equations, which is first order differential equations, which is high level algebra and calculus? Which do they teach first? The, the, one plus one plus one. the arithmetic. Why? Because you gotta you gotta learn the arithmetic before you can before you can get to pre-algebra, then algebra, and then pre-calculus algebra, and then calculus, and then cal two, three, and then differential equations. Why? You have to learn before you understand the more complicated things. Okay. 
that makes sense to us, right? I'm not going to take Grace out here and the first thing, the first, her first book is going to be, well, here is War and Peace by Tolstoy. Read this first, Grace. No, I'm going to get her, you know, the red puppy dog has a ball. And we're going to read small words with big pictures, right? God said, put things in order. Rightly divide the word of truth. Cut it up. Put it like you would a garden. There's so many examples in the Bible, and I'm sure you can think of one or two, where God talks about salvation like you would planting a tree or a, a plant that bears fruit. We've looked at this before, that God talks about bearing fruit as salvation. Okay? So rightly dividing the word of truth is not just chopping it up in bite-sized sections. No, it is, you must learn, what is it? And I should have put this verse in there because it makes sense. He that cometh to God must believe that he is and a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And I believe that's a key book. Okay. Um, turn to Hebrews chapter 4 while we're, while we're talking about that. Turn to Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. Now, my question this morning is how do you rightly divide the word of truth? And if you see something, say something. Yes, ma'am. Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And, uh, moreover, uh, uh, and moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yea, he gave good heed and sought out and set in order many proverbs. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words, and that which was written was upright and even words of truth. I like that a lot. I wish I'd have had that in my sermon. That's why I asked. <laughs> what was that again? Ecclesiastes? 12 verses 9 and 2. Okay. I believe that this Pam is cooking over there. I actually had it written next to it. Oh. <laughs> ah! Aha. Okay, so she I had pre work. I said it before, so that's why I wrote it down. She had pre work. Well, I appreciate you waiting to see if it was in my <laughs> My mama don't do that. You don't okay. right. No, 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 it's okay. Yeah. Well, y'all can now see where I'm headed, so you know if you're going to cut me off or not. And I appreciate some of y'all not cutting me off. Yeah. All right. Okay. So let's turn to turn to Hebrews chapter twelve. Turn to Hebrews chapter twelve. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 12 says, Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Well, is this the same kind of straight that we're talking about when Timothy is talking about, Paul's telling Timothy, cut it straight. It's the same kind of straight. Let's keep reading. Verse 14, follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person. What's a profane person? Well, he explains, as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye do not know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. All right, so why is this important? Well, what did Esau do? In Genesis 25, it says he despised his birthright. Nick, do you know what value his birthright was? His birthright was that his father, Isaac, was the son of Abraham. So Esau was the grandson of Abraham. Abraham had been told by God to teach his children that the Messiah was coming, that the one that would die for their sins was coming. So it was Esau as the firstborn's birthright to preach to his family. And he said, no thanks, that's dumb. Jacob said, 
I'll buy it. Jacob said, I value that. And Esau's dumb enough to sell it to me. You ever thought about that? Jacob went, I think he's just dumb enough to sell that thing to me. Not how dumb he was. Yep. And Esau realized later how much he threw away. God said, nope, too late. You didn't value it at the time. You threw it away. So make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned aside. What does that mean? If you're not rightly dividing the word of truth, if you're not teaching the word of God, people are going to fall away. People are going to stumble. Brother Glenn, there's all kinds of things that people teach that people stumble over. You know that people stumble over tithing? Well, I, I don't agree with I don't agree with Brother Josh's take on, on money. I, I don't know that I can come to church anymore. I don't know that I agree with Brother Josh's take on, on women wearing open-toed shoes in church. I, I, I don't know that I can come to church anymore. Do people stumble over everything? Y'all laughing, but it happens. I, you know what, Miss Teresa picked the paint from the ladies' bathroom, and I just, I can't stand that color. You know, I gotta find a new shirt. <laughs> I have heard all of these things, not as a joke. Okay. So, so as pastor, I go. That's not that important. That's not that important. What's important? The gospel. You don't like the paint, paint it. I don't care. You don't like the tithing, Brother Mike, we'll figure it out, right? The Lord will take care of us. Don't go in. What's that? If you don't like it, don't, don't use it. Don't go in. <laughs> you don't like the bathroom? Yeah, whatever. Uh, if you don't like the way, you know, if you don't like the shoes my wife wears, don't look at her feet. That's a real simple solution to me. Don't stumble over dumb stuff. Esau was stupid. Jacob saw it, okay? So he says, hey, let that lane be turned aside. Make straight paths. Cut it straight. Make it straight. When you're laying out the gospel, put it out where it makes sense. Letter. Make it even. Make it doable. Letter of the law versus spirit of the law. People get hung up over following the letter of the law versus the spirit. People get hung up in their own egos, and they use the law as an excuse. They get hung up in their own power. Folks, it's not my job to tell you how to live. It's not my job to micromanage you. Andrew, I don't think you should wear blue to church anymore. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> don't you dare. <laughs> you know, there are pastors like that. It's like, well, you know, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to decide what we all wear. I'm going to decide what movies we go see. I'm going to decide what food we eat on Sunday. Folks, that's not my job. My job is to be a messenger. I am not your boss, your CEO, or your or your tyrant. I'm also not a used car salesman trying to get you to buy what I'm selling. I am the messenger that says if you don't believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins, you will die and go to hell. That is my message. That's what I got. The good news is Jesus paid for it all. Smart or dumb, rich or poor, good or bad, didn't differentiate. Let's keep reading. Now turn to Second Tim. Turn back to Second Timothy, chapter two. We're going to keep reading. Second Timothy, chapter two. We, we we read verses fourteen and fifteen. We're going to start at verse sixteen. I've also comes to mind. I'll read this while you'll turn. In Matthew seven, it says, "Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat." Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Now, I hope you found 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 16. It says, But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase <clears throat> unto more ungodliness. And their word will eat as doth the canker, of whom is Hymenius and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. What are you talking about? Is it these two people? argued that the resurrection already happened and that that's what the Bible means when it says this. They weren't arguing that the Bible was wrong. They were arguing an interpretation of the Bible. What does he say? He says, avoid it. It eats as a canker. What's canker? Y'all know what that means? A sore. Right? Okay? <laughs> Nevertheless, 
The foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Y'all ever do any canning or... Say you got a really big cooking project. If you've been to my house the weekend before Christmas, you will witness Cookie Day. Cookie Day is an endeavor where we were going to bake many, many, many cookies. So before Cookie Day, I make sure that I have washed all the measuring cups because that is my bottleneck. I will run out of measuring cups. I will wash all the mixing bowls. That's my second bottleneck. Okay. I will wash all of the things that I need, and I won't even bother to put them away usually the day before. I'll set them out. I know that Will is going to come in here. She's going to pour sprinkles into this. And I know that Charlie's going to come in here, and he's going to pour food dyes into this, and I'm going to set them out. I'm going to prepare. I have a plan for how this is going to be used so that it's simple. Okay? Verse 22. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strife. Okay, so what is a foolish and unlearned question? I have been told there is no such thing as a stupid question. I have biblical proof that's not true. Right. Okay. All right. So what is a stupid question? I'll give you an example. I'll give you my favorite one. Now vote yes or no. If you say yes, raise your hand. Did Adam have a belly button? No. Do you know people ask that question? And they start arguing about it. Well, well, you know, he was the first man and all men have belly buttons. But scientifically we know that the belly button, okay, it's, it's just a scarf from the umbilical cord. But why are we arguing about this? Well, because we don't know. Do you need to know? Well, I'd like to know. That's different. Than, what are we doing? Now we're talking about a stupid question. So if you hear me say the word belly button question, that is my term for a dumb biblical question. It's such a thing. It's foolish to let unknown questions avoid. There's lots of things, Nick, that you'll look in the Bible and go, this is a great history book. I'd like to know, you know, what, what happened here? Where did Cain get his wife? Did Adam have a belly button? Uh, did, did, was Adam missing a rib? Uh, these are these are interesting questions. The Bible doesn't say. Do they have value? The Bible says foolish and unlearned questions avoid. Now you can you can have an interest in it. That's fine. Is that the gospel? Yeah, everybody shake your head with me. No. Okay. Does it matter to the eternal destination? Of an immortal soul, whether or not Adam had a belly button. No. So that's a dumb question. It's the question you ask when you get up there. What's that? Yeah, the question you so ask the question you ask when you see him, okay? Now, here what's an important question? Can a homosexual go to heaven? That's an important question. That's not a dumb question. What's the answer? Yes. Yes. Okay. So people have questions. The Bible does answer some of them. <coughs> Who? Let's keep reading. Verse 24. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God, peradventure, will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. Okay. So, Avoid stupid questions. Let's go back. How do you rightly divide the word of truth? You stick to what's important. I have never, ever plowed a field with a live animal and a hand plow. Okay? I have, however, tried to mow my grass in straight lines. It's harder than it looks. Okay, so why is it harder than it looks? Well, I'm out here mowing my grass, 
and I've got a line here. I got my I got my my, my wide deck out here, and I'm pointed this way. And my my goal is to nice even lines because everybody on Hickory Hammock Road can see my see what kind of job I do. <laughs> While I can be doing this, Brother Kevin drives by and honks at me. Hey, buddy, how you doing this? Oh no! And I'm all the way off the thing. Okay. Why? I took my eye off of my goal. Now my line isn't straight anymore. So if you're plowing straight, neighbor Kevin walks by on his horse or, or whatever and goes, how you doing, brother? And I go, oh, fine. Now my, now my crops are going to be off the center. Why? I took my eye off of what was important. You know, when, they, they, when I was taught to drive, my mama taught me to drive, which I'm, praise the Lord, I'm a good driver. The only time she wanted that. The only time she said she wanted someone else to teach her kids. Anyway. Um, but mama, when she's teaching me to drive, she says, don't look at the hood ornament. Or don't look at the front of the car. Look out there. And don't look at the center line or the oncoming traffic. You look ahead because your hands and your feet are going to follow your eyes. You're going to go in the direction that you're looking. So look in the right direction. So when you rightly divide the word of truth, when you cut a straight line, keep your eyes focused on what's important. And y'all can figure out the answer to that. What is important? The gospel. What is the gospel? As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. You've got to keep your eyes focused on Christ or you'll wander off and your lines won't be straight. Well, what does it matter? What does it matter, Kevin, if you if you plow a crooked line and you plant your corn in a zigzag? I'd rather keep it walking. Well, maybe Nick's got to come reap what you sowed. So Nick is out here trying to trying to harvest what you what you sowed in a zigzag line. Maybe he can, but it makes it harder for him. Maybe Nick can, can make up the difference, but it's harder for him. He can. <laughs> All right. Let's turn to run out of time. Trying to figure out where I want to land here. Let's turn to a second. We're close. Turn a page. Turn to Second Timothy chapter three. Second Timothy chapter three, verse fourteen. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Last week, we talked about what, Brother Glenn? Someone said it. Heard it. The three. Well, you're better half. Get the right answer, right? Uh, the three tenses of salvation. So there's there's three salvation. The, the three tenses of salvation. The three salvations. So the Bible says here in, in Second Timothy, there are things that are profitable for doctrine, some for reproof. What's reproof, Brother Kevin? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> reproof is when you go to Nick and you say, I'm gonna teach you how to change your oil better because the way you're doing it is not good for your truck. Okay? That's reproof. It, I, I look at it in the way it's reteaching somebody something. Uh, the, and I also throw in the, re, the definition of rebuke is when you go out there and you scream, Nick, stop doing that! That's rebuke. But reproof, you want to reprove, not rebuke, right? So, um, so it's probable for doctrine. It's probable for teaching. For correction and for instruction in righteousness and just how to do it the right way. The man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished with all good works. So there are pieces of the Bible that are for your life, to help you. And there are pieces of the Bible that are to make sure that you understand that nothing that you do in this life is what counts to get you to heaven. People miss that. There are pieces here that say, okay, Olivia, you should hate something. 
right? But there are also people that say that the Bible says you don't know, trust Christ. Now, if you don't behave yourself, you still trust Christ. But if you behave yourself, you don't trust Christ, then you don't get to go to heaven. So there's pieces of the Bible that you must rightly divide. You must set out, here's the straight line, here's Christ. Let's not get distracted over here on this other set of, of, of acreage with things that are not important right now. <clears throat> Rightly dividing the word of truth. I think of this as stay focused only on Christ. Now turn to, I got a lot, I got way too much finishing. Uh, Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And we'll, we'll try to wrap it up here. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Okay. How does someone handle the word of God deceitfully? It's a good definition. What's deceit? They're going to fool you. I heard Nick say something. Lie. It's a trick. Deceit, yeah. Um, They're going yeah. to lie to you? Mm -hmm. yeah. Y'all ever, ever been to... Uh, car dealership or someone's having a sale or you go somewhere they, they had a big poster up there and it says uh, I, don't, I took I actually get eyeglasses they're like eyeglasses $199 you go in there and it's not $199 it's $799 $799 so you saw this it says oh that's for that's for like only these five different frames or whatever the ugly frames in the building right I'm like well then it, your sign's wrong well no 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 that's just the so you lied to me to get me in this building that's deceit right okay Deceit is a lie. How do people lie about the word of God? Nobody tell me a lie you've heard about the word of God. You gotta ask Jesus for forgiveness. You gotta ask Jesus for forgiveness. Is that is that in the word of God for salvation? It's not. But why do people preach that? So they're handling the word of God deceit. Well that's my that's Josh, that's your interpretation, it's my interpretation. We're all equally valid. Is that how that works? Okay. Are people purposefully telling you the wrong thing because they hate you? So there's, there's, there's a few out there, I'm sure. I'm, I'm talking mostly about preachers and, and the gospel, but uh, I'm sure. Most people don't understand themselves. Why not? Why, why, why do people... Not understand this when they read it. Because they don't get into it. Because they don't get into it. Because they don't get into it. Well, we also have an enemy whose objective is to deceive us. And he's really good at his job. Yeah. They're terrible. They're terrible. They're terrible. Their cloud lines are all. Yes. <laughs> all correct. I've heard preachers say things like, you've got to straighten up so God can love you. Is that in the Bible? For God so loved the well-behaved world. For God so loved the church attendance perfectionist world. For God so loved the conservative American Republican world. For God so loved only the people that speak English world. Brother, the list gets shorter all the time. <laughs> For God so loved the world. Okay. So anybody that says God doesn't love the people that aren't behaving is handling the word of God deceitfully. They are off somewhere in the back 40 and they've forgotten the point of where they are. They are not dividing the word of truth correctly. All right. Let me finish this chapter. Let's finish this. Uh, passage and we'll, we'll wrap up. Verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, and whom the God of this world 
hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, let me say that again, for we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Folks, to rightly divide the word of truth, you have to be focused on Christ. To rightly divide the word of truth, you talk about how someone goes to heaven and their and their life, their behavior, all of that, that's in some other field. When you write when you read the word of truth, look for context, look for the continuity, but most of all, you're looking for how it points to Christ. Christ is the subject the author, the purpose, and the point of this book. If you are rightly dividing the word of truth, you will always come back to Jesus. There's an old saying, you say all roads lead to Rome because Rome made all the roads. All the verses point back to Jesus because Jesus wrote all the verses. Does it point back to you behaving yourself, Brother Kevin? Does it point back to you asking God to forgive you, Brother Mike? It points back to Jesus loved you, forgave you, died for you, and he wants you to trust him to go to heaven. Yes, ma'am. Math is my least favorite subject, but I will never forget how much it went down. <laughs> but a 90 degree angle is a perfect angle. If you rightly divide, you perfectly divide it. That's what the word rightly means to me. Okay. All right. Do it, do it correctly so that there's no deviation. Do it perfectly. All right. I've got more, but I'll stop. Let's pray. <laughs> Dear Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for the chance to look in your word. Lord, I ask that you help people to take some time this week, think about you, think about your word, think about what they've learned, think about how they can help others. Lord, I pray that the people in this room come to the knowledge of Christ if they're not already. And then I pray that we reach the world around us for Christ's sake. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.